and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And on today's 156th episode of The Thriller Zone, I am thrilled to say that international best-selling author Tess Gerritsen will join our podcast. You know Tess from her Rizzoli and Isle series, her medical thriller standalones, her suspense novels, her romantic suspense novels, and now her newest release, which happens to be the first in her new Martini Club series, The Spy Coast. From medical doctor to New York Times bestseller, please welcome Tess Gerritsen. Well, a great big welcome to Tess Gerritsen here on the Thriller Zone. Hi there. Hi. It is an honor to see you and to meet you. I'm telling you, uh, one of the biggest and the best. Thank you so much for your time. Well, it's always fun to talk about books, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I saw you at Dasher Con just months ago. Uh, and I knew then that you'd be the perfect fit on the podcast because between you, <laughs> you and uh, Lee Goldberg going back and forth. Yeah, I know. I would love to go on the road with Lee Goldberg. He's like, you know, I'd be the straight person and he'd be the, he'd be the, the fun one. But he's one of those guys that makes everybody feel like they are the most important and they're the funniest in the room, which is a gift in and of itself, isn't it? Oh, yeah, no, he is the funniest man I know. He really is. <laughs> And a great event, right? Yes. I love Bouchercon. That was my hometown, San Diego. So it was great to be there. That is my next note. You Were you born and raised here? Was this like from day one, right? I was born at Mercy, uh, at, uh, Mercy Hospital in San Diego. Yes, I was. And I grew wow. up there, went to high school there, and uh, left for college. And then, unfortunately, never went back. But I'm living in a good place now. Well, that was the other question is, um, and, and main figures prominently in the book. So tell me about real quick before we jump onto the book, what is, of course, it's a vast difference between San Diego and Maine, but what has been the biggest difference to you and the thing that you like the most about your new locale? Oh, the lack of traffic. There, there is no <laughs> traffic here. The trees, those seasons. Uh, I love the seasons. I know Californians think, oh, yeah, I had the best weather in the world. And yeah, it's nice. But there's something about that first snowfall. Uh, and I think it's just a really creative place to be. It, it, there's some magic to seeing the seasons change. And, uh, you know, somebody asked me one day, what's it like living on the West Coast? And I said, well, it's everything great that you think it is, but there's a little bit of Groundhog Day to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. I, I sort of feel like I, you know, I can feel the year passing much more um, acutely because, you know, first of all, when do the leaves change? You know, when is that first frost? And um, and there's always something new to look forward to when it comes to weather. Good, good for you. And you've been there thirty three years. Oh wow. Okay. Well, now I know this is a very busy week. We're on a truncated schedule. You got places to go and people to see and things to talk about. So we're going to jump right into the Spy Coast. Now, before I tell you some of the thoughts that I have, for those who don't know yet, let's hear that glorious elevator pitch about the Spy Coast. A retired chicken farmer in Maine turns out to have a secret past. She was a CIA agent and suddenly she's being called back to the old job because a dead body is found in her driveway. When you start out the, the pitch with chicken farmer, you think, oh, what is this going to be? A little house on the prairie or, uh, you know, something like that. But mm, no, folks, don't don't be thinking that because it's got everything that you want. <laughs> Including chicken. <laughs> and you know what's funny, Tess? I t said to my wife as I was reading the mug, you know, babe, what if we were to get some chickens? It sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun. They're fun animals and they give you eggs. Yeah. Well, I want to say without this from the bottom of my heart, this is one of the best books I have read this year. Well, thank you. I put a lot into that, I have to say. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot about Maine in there, which I love too. I, I'm going to take it one step further. I think it's easily one of the top 10 books that I've read since I've started this podcast, which is now we're approaching two and a half years. And wow. I've read a lot of books, Tess. And the reason I love it so much is, and, and forgive me if I sound cliche, but this book really does have it all. Because you've got the spies and the intrigue, which is surprising as it sneaks in. You've got humor and colorful characters, all of which that are burned into your memory by the time you've done. 
along with enough murder and mayhem to please every little mystery writer. But the little wonderful love story that you have at the core is pretty amazing. Kind of heartbreaking too, but I mean, not to, not to give away any, any secrets, but that, that is, uh, is, uh, is at the center of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And matter of fact, I'm going to gush a little bit because I can't help myself. First of all, this Maggie character, your, your central character, the, man, I want to spend years with her. <laughs> yeah. And what's, what I love about her is that she's, um, you know, we're getting older and, um, it's fun to think about these retirees who really are all around me here in mid coast Maine who've had sit, you know, intelligence, uh, uh, backgrounds, um, to think about how they are capable, they're smart, they could, they could outthink the rest of us. And yet they are, um, their secrets, their superpower is that they are misunderstood and, and dismissed. Uh, so it's, um, it's fun to think of old people who really have it all, but don't, you know, necessarily show it. Well, the word that comes to my mind is dwelling on this is refreshing. It's so refreshing to find someone writing about characters that uh, are uh, seasoned. I'm going to use the word yeah. seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the fun also was this, this conflict between Maggie and her group, which are there in the 60s and 70s, and the local police woman who's in her 30s, um, who, you know, she's a little bit arrogant because she's a youthful cop and she thinks she knows her town and she thinks she can handle everything. And then she comes up smack against these 60 and 70 year olds and thinks, who are these people and why are they always one step ahead of me? So that, you know, that challenge of, of, of youth um, misunderstanding you or underestimating you, that was a lot of the fun, this, this conflict. The underestimating that Joe did, you're absolutely right. Oh, it's always, and it's the same thing. And I think uh, this is interesting. As I was looking at these season characters, the Martini Club, and I was wondering how much of this, Dave, I'm asking myself, how much of is it because you don't get to read anything quite like this book these days, A, or B, hey, ding dong, you're that age now, so that's why you're relishing it. <laughs> or it's, it's my age now, that's why I'm writing it. But, you know, you're right. It's, it's, um, it's not that these stories weren't interesting for all time. It's that the industry, whether it's Hollywood or whether it's publishing, has always thought that everybody wants to read about young people, that uh, Hollywood wants the young faces, the pretty faces, and who cares about somebody who's 65 or older? Um, and I think that, that that cultural belief is is emanating really from Hollywood. Um, because when you look at British television or British books, they are perfectly willing to to feature older characters. We just, we just don't do that in this country. And it's sad. It's so friggin' sad. Um, I, I, we watch, my wife and I watch a lot of British television and I'm with you and I never stop and think for a single second. Oh my gosh, they're so old. I, I look at, there's a, um, what's the phrase? There's a, uh, uh, believability and wisdom that you know that you're, this character is bringing to the party mm -hmm. and I just flat out like it. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I, I was co completely addicted to this show called Foil's War. I don't know if you ever watched that. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. So it's about a, you know, a middle aged detective during World War II. And as the thing goes on, I mean, I think the show was probably filmed over 10 years and Foil gets older. He become, he works, starts to work with MI5. And you think here, as you see the age show up on the actor's face as he, you know, normally goes older, you also feel like you're seeing the wisdom growing in that face. And, by the end of it, even may, though Foyle may have been 65, I was in love with him. So it's, it turns out that what we really love when we read these books and we watch television, we love the characters. We don't, we don't love their physical features, but we love the wisdom that they, they have. You just think, and this is so indicative of your style, I think, but I love the fact that they, there is a wisdom and a, and a depth to these characters. And I found myself going, oh, I want more of that. And it's so fabulous. You're, you're in the present and then you're going back and then you're telling it from one perspective, one person's perspective, and then another. And a lot of times I read a lot of books that this can get confusing and you're like, oh, geez, here we go again. Another trick. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like a trick. It was completely seamless. Everything stacked on the next chapter perfectly. It was just so elegantly woven. It, it is a challenge doing this, this past and present, uh, structure. And, um, I, 
it was the only way I could actually tell the story though. Um, but you're right. It can be very confusing and you can't really do it too much. But I think the point is just as it's time to go back into the past, there's something in the present that sets that up and you, and, and it feels like it's time to go back and look at, look at what Maggie did 17 years ago, because that is the relevant point in the plot. And I think that maybe is your biggest gift. And I'm going to hit this here in a second. So I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but it's the, it's the timing. And that's such a, it's such a delicate balance. I have read books that do this before and it's, and I, and it's, it gets, feels convoluted, but you don't do that. I'd like to step back a second and go, I know that you, you started off in the medical field. You want a do- where you were a doctor. And I find that so fascinating because very few times do I run across a doctor who says, you know, I'm going to chuck it all and be a, a, an international bestselling author. Tell me about that process. <laughs> I wanted to be a writer when I was seven. So that, that was my, that was my first goal. And, uh, but I have, you know, I had really conservative parents who said, that's really a hard way to make a living. You should go into the sciences. Anyway, I ended up in the sciences and I, you know, I like, I loved medicine. I love, I love science, but that writer instinct was always there. So when I went on maternity leave, I'm home with my kid, my sleeping son. And that's when I wrote my first book. This is this, uh, you know, confluence of, of motherhood and getting time away from the hospital and finally having the time to daydream and play around with a possible book that got it all started. Folks, when you get to meet all these characters and they're, they're all delightful and they're fully developed and they're robust and you know people in your past who can kind of relate to. But I love the fact that a lot of times thrillers We'll shoot out of the gate with this big, bad, bloody explosion, murder, et cetera, fill in the blank, mm-hmm. and then spend a lot of time on that. What you do is kind of the opposite. So you drop this bomb, so to speak, you know, figurative bomb, and then you just delve into the story and you, you use the word characters. It really is all about characters. So what you're doing is you're so fully engaged in the characters and the life and their history that you almost forget and don't even worry about the fact that, yeah, there's a murder that's going on and I'm going to go hunt this person down. Well, you know, I, I have, I have a problem with thrillers that are slam bam action from page one to page, you know, 350. Um, and it comes, I guess, from uh, watching a lot of James Bond films. When I watch James Bond films, I find that as soon as the car chase happens or the fight happens, I get really bored. You know, okay, so so they're squealing around and maybe somebody's getting shot. and But that's that's not what engages me. What engages me is really good dialogue. And I'm thinking about one of the Bond films where the most riveting part was this dialogue between James Bond and the woman that he's falling in love with on a train. You know, they, and nothing's happening. It's just the two of them talking. That is what gets my, my juices running. And uh, I think it's what gets my juices running when I'm reading books as well. I, I'm very bored by action. Yeah. I'd love to know your process, if you don't mind, just a real quick thumbnail sketch of kind of how long it takes for you to go from gestation to first draft to that period where you go, okay, this feels really good. And I'm going to hand it off to the editors. Oh, it's, it's sheer, my <laughs> sheer chaos. That's not all I can say. I, I'm a, I'm a seat of the pants writer. No. Um, yeah. I start off with the voice of a character in my head, really. And it was Maggie Bird. And the one thing she said to me was, I'm not the woman I used to be. And I thought, okay, let's find out who you used to be. So um, that's where the whole book started. I knew it was about spies in Maine because, and I don't know if your re- listeners know this, but I live in an area with a lot of retired CIA agents. Uh, and I was wondering what retirement was like for them. I mean, what, what if you get called back into the field? What if you've got to strap on a gun again after 20 20- Years. And what is it like with your creaky joints to try and be James Bond again? So that was that was what drew me into the story. But it was really Maggie Bird. And I knew <clears throat> from the very beginning that she was a sad woman, that this, some terrible thing had happened on her last mission. Um, and it was it was she who was showing me the way. Um, I'd get to a point where I was in this in the present day and something bad would happen. I think, OK, this is related to her past. Maggie, what happened? And then I would feel very, very um, natural to me to go back 17 years and see 
she was up to. So um, it was a chaotic thing. I was I was letting the character tell me what was happening. Um, and I have to say that because I don't do a um, any kind of a synopsis ahead of time, I tore up a lot of pages. I probably wrote two to three times as many pages as were actually printed because they all ended up in the trash can. <laughs> uh, but that that's just the way it is with me. I write myself into blind alleys and then I don't know how to get out and I have to figure out what I should be doing next. But that doesn't bother you because that's your process. And evidently with uh, 30 novels, 40 countries, 40 million copies sold worldwide, you got a pretty good idea what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And every time I get to that point where I'm blocked, I think, how did I do this the last time? It's every book has been a struggle for me because I always hit that wall, you know, halfway to two thirds of the way through the first draft when I don't know what happens next. But I also have learned after 32 books that to, I, I should trust myself. I should trust myself that I can claw my way out of this this cave I've I've ended up in. Yeah, excuse me, thirty two. Yes. By the way, uh, I don't remember <laughs> another uh, one degree of operation. So you created Rosalie and Ives, mm -hmm. which was just a fantastic series and long running. And I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, back at the time when... Um, when Angie... Didn't Angie Harmon move there? Yes. When Angie moved into town and she would either bump me or I'd come in right after her for voiceover sessions. And I thought, I mean, th at this time, she was one of the biggest stars in this tiny little town of Charlotte. I'm like, what are you doing here? Well, I like it here and so forth and so on. But... And I was like, oh, man, that's – and what series? And then he, she told me, then I followed it. I'm like, oh, who's this Tess Garrett's? And, uh, you know, let me let me learn more. And here it is now, years later, and I'm reading your book. So it's just a really cool, fun way to – Well, that is funny, yeah. Yeah. It, she's a goddess, isn't she? Uh, She's stunning on, like, seven levels <laughs> yes, because – not only is she breathtakingly beautiful, uh, but it's her, uh, the way she walks in the room and makes you feel like, hey, uh, let's get to work and have a beer and have some laughs. Yeah. No, and Texas you don't girl. expect that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I, folks, as you're thinking about picking this book up, uh, there's a few people who say a few things about our friend S that you might want to hear. Now, when I ran across this blurb from Stephen King, where he said on the cover of one of your books, Tess Gerritsen is an automatic must read in my house. I was like, first of all, you don't hear that kind of accolade very often from Mr. King. And what did that make you feel like? And, I, and I'm trying to remember, I want to say the book was Gravity. Tell me about that. Um, well, that was pretty amazing because I was a long term reader of Stephen King before that. I mean, what, what who, anybody yeah. who read The Stand is going, oh, my God, this man is a genius. Um, yeah, so I was I was really kind of I was amazed by that because I didn't know anybody had given him the book Gravity, um, and that that was well that was actually Gravity is an example of how I'm over I'm all over the place. I mean that was science fiction, right? right. Um, and then I've written medical thrillers and historicals and horror and everything else, but. Yeah, that was that was a great moment to, to get called that King had said that. You know, we as writers, I write myself too, not to your degree, of course, but I, we all sit around and go, oh, what what would it be like? And I have had more people on the show, and I'm trying to think. There's a couple people that have been on the show recently. Don Winslow is the first one that popped into my head who said when he read of a particular writer, oh, geez, what? and he's reading this guy, and I won't pull that name out right now. And uh, What am I even doing writing? You know, how can I possibly compete in this world? Yeah. I thought that a little bit about your book. I'm like, it's so perfectly crafted. And so when, when your eye can slide across the, of, across the page, you're not, you're not getting caught up in a lot of little tiny technical things that we all know about, but don't really study too much. Y you just get lost in the story. I want to ask you, do you have someone when you read them, you go like, oh, I can't possibly compete with this. Oh, you know, this happens all the time. It's really, <laughs> I, I, of course, you would ask me the names of these authors because it's immediately their names go right out of my, out of my head. Um, and, oh gosh, um, I'm thinking about re writers that so inspired me and so swept me up that I couldn't stop reading. One of them um, was uh, Larry McMurtry. I think oh. that was one of the first books you know, uh, Lonesome Dove, where you just forget about the writing. You just, you just get into these characters and you follow these characters. And, and um, I think he was the one that really opened my eyes to fantastic writing. 
There are so many books out there right now, so many people trying to make it in this business. Um, and a lot of those books come across my desk. And I say to myself, how does one compete in this world? And it, then again, you read your kind of work and I go, uh, how do you compete? And then I go, right about the time I want to kick myself, I go, well, wait a minute. There's going to be somebody somewhere that likes my particular take on something. Do you ever have those? You have to have those days somewhere you go, all right, this is a little yeah. piece of crap. Well, well, I say that all the time. I mean, <laughs> this, that, look at my first drafts. They are really a piece of crap. And I guess we can say that on your show. Um, <laughs> but I think that what I've learned over the years, I've been at this so long, is that I'm not competing with anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a story because my characters want their story told. And when you get to that stage where you don't worry about the sales anymore, you don't worry about the reviews, you just write because you love this, this character, Maggie, and you want to know what, why is she so wounded? And you write for the joy of it. Um, that's, that's when you can really let loose and, and, and be the best writer you can be. You have to love, we have to love what we're doing because there's so many, ways we will get discouraged. So many things that will make us want to stop. Um, and I'm thinking of writers who spend five years, 10 years writing something from the bottom, from, you know, right from their heart, their very best. This is all they've thought about. This is their life. And then finally it gets published and some lady in Peoria writes her review on Amazon and it's a three letter review, meh, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's what we have to deal with is, is, are, are the people who don't like our books, the people who won't buy our books, the reviewers who hate our books, the editors who don't want to buy the books. You have to love what you do and do it regardless of what the world tells you. Well, this almost sounds like my closing question, which we're getting very close to. So I'm not going to mention that. I'm going to go back to one more quote that I heard. And, and, and this one just jumped off the page at me. It was the Chicago Tribune. Tess has an imagination that allows her to conjure up depths of human behavior so dark and frightening, she makes, I love this, Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft seem like goody two-shoes. I'm not scary. I am not scary at all, I swear. <laughs> and, and, I, and I gotta come back to Maggie for one last comment before we bounce, is I so love this character, but she has this way. And, and I hope this is a compliment because as I was starting the book, I felt almost a, a kinship to Sue Grafton's character way back in the Alphabet series. And I'm like, oh, there's that familiarity. It's the, you get to get inside her world that has nothing to do with outside of her world. And you just want to know what her world is, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I think it helps that I wrote her in the first person. Um, there are a lot of readers who hate first person, uh, narrators. I love them because I really, you're right. You really feel like you are inside their heads and see the world through their eyes. Why do, I know this is kind of rhetorical and, or you don't know the answer, but I, I beg the question, why do people have a hard time? Because I found it absolutely delicious because I got to inhabit her. I, I don't know. I don't know. I love first person, but you We'll see sometimes, you know, in the review, yeah, I shouldn't be reading reader reviews, but that is one of the, con yeah, it was one of the complaints. I hate first person and I read it despite the fact it's first person. Um, readers are funny. They have their own little quirks. And I have a lot of people who were very upset that Maggie had to protect her chicken flock and had to shoot a fox. I mean, I, a lot of people saying, I'm not reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> because you shot a fox. No, which was an endangering your livelihood. Right. All right. So as we begin to wrap, there's two questions I have. One of them is, and, and you, you got to tell me, Tess, uh, if you had to describe your, what I call your secret sauce, because you clearly have one, it's very obvious. What would you say it is? And this pertains to both uh, pulling in readers as well as having a prolifically uh, astonishing body of work. But what, what, what do you suppose if you, if someone said, Oh, what's Tessa's secret sauce? Digging for the emotional core of who your, your characters are. I mean, I, I try to, I try to think of what I'm feeling with everything, every scene I write. What are they feeling? What is the, you know, what is driving them? It's, it's not the, it's not the murder. It's not the technology. It's, I, mean, I don't care about gadgets and I don't care about crime scene personnel so much. I want to know what you're feeling. Um, and that's, I think that's what draws us forward. That is so spot on and so excellent. <clears throat> and when you were describing earlier about that you're sitting and listening, almost channeling Maggie, 
I've tried to describe this to my wife, Tammy, who is the absolute opposite of me, which is probably why we work so well. She has spreadsheets and documents and logistics. And I'm just like, oh yeah, but what about this idea? <laughs> but she, when, when she, when we first got together, she, she'd say something to me about how do you know such and such? I'm like, I just sit and wait and listen for the character to talk to me. And she looked at me like, am I making the right life decision hooking up with you? Because. <laughs> The voices. We love the voices, don't we? We do. All right. And the last question I always close with, and a lot of the listeners who follow the show are writers, either up and coming or seasoned, like your best piece of writing advice. And I know you kind of hinted on it a little bit earlier, but I'd love to hear it if you have that one thing that goes, yeah, this is my best advice to you. Finish the book. <laughs> that's, that's all. You know, I, there are so many writers that, that never finish their book. They'll get halfway and they'll get discouraged and they'll think, oh, I'm going to go try something else. I would tell them to just forge ahead and, and get to the end. You can fix everything. You can, you can figure out a way to make something better. But if you don't have those words on the page, there's nothing to fix. That's so good, by the way. And you probably don't ever stop and think, oh, am I hitting? the right number of word count. Uh, yeah, it's just really all about the story. But yeah. I, I admit, though, I, I, I do. I do look at how many how many words I have written. Because, I mean, you know, those, those word processing programs, they tell you, right? They tell you how many words you've hit. And I will, I will look at that. And I, you know, you want to hit the minimum that your editor is expecting. And is there a minimum these days? What is, what is the, what are all the cool kids doing these days, Tess? What is the, what is that norm? I don't know. I think, the, I think actually cool kids are thinking books should be shorter. Um, and it's not because of us. It's not because of our storytelling. It's because the reading public has just got no, they've got no, no concentration. Yeah. <laughs> and sadly, uh, I think this is happening everywhere. I mean, this podcast started out like an hour and a half and now everyone's like, can you make it shorter? I want to listen to it. But you know, same with books. How about a half hour podcast and a th- 280 page book. You know, yeah. Like, well, you know that, you know, that, that, uh, acronym TLDR too long, didn't too long read. Didn't read yeah. <laughs> yes. I think I am. I'm feeling that from the public a lot. Yeah. And, uh, perhaps a little bit about social media too, but that's a whole different conversation. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, the book is the spy coast. And if you want to learn more, go to Tess All that information will be below, but Tess, once again, a superb, beautiful, friendly, fun, sad, romantic read. I loved every page of it. Thank you. And thank you so much for uh, jumping through hoops. I know this is a busy week and uh, the book is dropping as this show is dropping. And we wish you the hugest success you can possibly have. And once again, thank you for joining us on the show. You were great. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, Tess, for a wonderful time. Now, let me tell you about the next superstar who joins our November Women Thriller Writers Month. Marjorie DeLuca, known for her bevy of suspense, historical thrillers, and sci-fi for teens, will talk with me about her latest thriller, The Night Side. That's Monday, November 20th on The Thriller Zone. Your front row seat to the best thrillers. The Thriller Zone.